Find other great podcasts like this one at podmoth.network. Hi, I'm Molly. And I'm Abigail. We're sisters. And we believe in ghosts. Welcome to Supernatural Sisters, a podcast all about ghostly encounters, bone-chilling monsters, and basically anything that goes bump in the night. Each week, we talk about a haunted place, a legendary monster, or a story that sends shivers down our spine. And maybe we'll talk about the pottery scene from Ghost. He's not a ghost in that scene. There are other parts of that movie where he's a ghost. Subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And remember, we, we believe, believe you. you. Everybody, welcome back to my second self and I. It's Sunday. That means I get to yell jokes at my microphone again. Hooray! My name is Matt. I am your conduit for nonsense as your host and also as your co-host. Spoiler alert, if you haven't figured it out yet, or if this is your first episode, that is also me. Why? Because why not? Hello. If you haven't done so already, I would suggest listening to either one of the two episodes I put out last week. One was about Boone Helm, the Kentucky Cannibal, and the other was a fun little bonus anthology episode. That's where I find three separate stories that are all crazy as hell to tell you, that have nothing to do with each other, but they're just fun. So if you have a spare 30 minutes after this, maybe go check that out. What are we doing today? Well, I'm gonna say the word cream and abortion a lot. And between today's story, H.H. H. Holmes and Jack the Ripper, we are almost going to be telling the same story for the third time this month. That's how similar these stories are, at least in my mind. Today we're going over the story of Thomas Neil Cream, if that is his real name, one of the many men whom, at one time or another, was thought to possibly be Jack the Ripper. I just can't seem to stay away from that guy, can I? Out every week this month, it's been Jack the Ripper this, Jack the Ripper that. I just can't get away from him. All these late game investigations and theories from people with, you know, actual resources are really making my eyes and brain hurt with all the extra research I have to do. Not to worry, though. As your conduit for nonsense, I am here to tell you the connection there is flimsy at best. It's eerily similar how much those three cases have in common. The victim profile, the time period, the dates are really similar... The locations are all pretty much the same, and many of the names of the victims could be substituted for any of the other victims. This is also going to be the last pre-1900s themed episode I do for a while. This will finish out the month of time travel tragedies, and I'm kind of running low on time machine fuel anyway, so that just kind of worked out. Plus, like I said, this one's super similar to all the others, so I'm kind of just excited for something a little bit different, which is why next week slash month I'm doing non-American murders! That's another thing, too. A lot of stories I came across this month weren't even American ones. Like, they were pre-1900s, but they weren't in this country, so I wanted to save them for another time. You know, that probably has very little to do with the fact that America was barely a country for most of the 19th centuries. We're not even 300 years old. Yeah, we're just a little wee baby country, like a toddler. Hey, this could be fun, actually. If you follow the Instagram page, I just had an idea. Send me a message with the answer to the following question. If the United States was a person, what stage of life do you think it would currently be in? Baby, toddler, decrepit old man or woman? You tell me. Just don't make it political. I am not currently interested in politics. Just have fun with it. If you want to do that or tell me about other stuff I should talk about, there are two really good places for you to do that. Alex, what are those? Instagram at Second Self Podcast or the show email mysecondselfandi at gmail.com. Okay, now that that's out of the way, we can actually just go ahead and get started. Full disclosure, though, this guy's early life, this Mr. Cream, the early life part of his story is going to go by super quick. Just wanted to let you know that ahead of time. Also super quick, this is a comedy show. Expect jokes and general goofiness. I am your conduit for nonsense after all. The good news for this episode is that I'm only really going to be using one source to keep myself and my second self from stressing ourselves out about details. Why? Because honestly, the only other thing I would want to find for this story is literally anything about him from between his birth and graduation from medical school. Check this out. Here's what I have for his early life. 
This is from the awesome new thing that I got, which is a digital newspaper trial subscription, and it's super sick. I will put the link for this article in the description for those of you who are interested, as always. Early life of Thomas Neal Cream goes like this. Born in Scotland, in Glasgow in 1850, was the oldest of eight. The family moved to Canada four years later in 1854. Come now, children, everyone on the boat or you'll be left behind. He worked with his dad doing lumber stuff and shipbuilding stuff for most of his childhood. And then finally, after all of that, he graduates from McGill University in Montreal in 1876 with his thesis being written on chloroform. That's literally all I can find on his childhood, including from this article. Born, moved to a new country with the fam, and bing, bang, boom, now you're a doctor. And while I'd love to speculate on the wee baby Cream's childhood, how about we focus on what we do know about him instead? Like that he was known as the Lambeth Poisoner, performed several, and I mean several, back alley abortions, he loved blackmail, and his preferred method for killing was by the use of strychnine. He was one of the smartest people in his graduating class, carried himself with a garrulous, dapper, and boastful manner, which all seemed to fit well within his devil-may-care attitude toward life. He's thought to have killed around eight victims, but we've got just a little bit of time to cover before we get there. Cream entered into McGill University in 1872 to study medicine. He was described as, quote, fast and extravagant, maintaining a stylish carriage, and being addicted to ostentatious clothes and jewelry. Sounds like he's basically a rich kid with lots of fancy rich kid designer clothes and shit. You know, I wonder if they... Yeah, I wonder if they competed to, like, see who had ni nicer stuff back then, like how we do now. Like, you know how some guys will have a who's is bigger contest, but with their cars? I wonder if the rich 19th century doctor students were doing that with their horse-drawn carriages. You think that puny thing can beat this statuesque symbol of wealth? I have a team of four horses and you only have two! Oh please, just because you have more doesn't make it faster. I guarantee my two horsepower could outrun your four horsepower any day of the week. Alright, you're on. Tomorrow morning, meet me at the dead man's corner and we'll settle this like men. No, I still haven't quite mastered a proper London British accent yet. Still turns Aussie for some reason. I'm trying, okay? God! Cream also taught Sunday school and YMCA for a time while earning his degree, which I guess would just be the thing to do back then, wouldn't it? Just teach Jesus to the little kids on Sunday and racquetball to his peers the rest of the week? Probably not much else to do, not like he could have gone to the movies. He could have read a book. Oh, what, you don't think he's doing enough reading at school? He's in doctor school, because he did do a lot of reading. In fact, he did so much reading that he graduated! And then he kept reading afterwards, but this was more about trying to scam an insurance company than uh, personal leisure. He was busy scanning policy documents for any kind of loophole to try to get $1,000 out of them for his personal goods. Which is why when two weeks after he graduated and his lodgings went up in flames, the police were sus pretty much immediately. This is clearly the work of a clever dapper hat wearing arsonist. They just didn't know who he was yet. So Cream files a claim for just under a thousand doll hairs, $978.40 to be precise, but the insurance company is lactose intolerant, they can't handle a lot of cream, so they only settle on about 350 bucks. A sad day in the Creamy household, now he and his new wife Flora Eliza Brooks, whom he met and married earlier that year, would have to do without. Did they always get married that quickly back then? Uh, no. Turns out, Mr. Cream is his real name, and we don't have to worry about that anymore because Flora was pregnant. Oh, gross. But not anymore. The family doctor came by and said that she was pregnant, but there had been an abortion performed, which was the cause of her recent illness. What? You, you can get sick from that? I mean, I guess it would depend on, you know, how well sterilized the tools were, but I think her sickness was actually uh, something else. Either way... Papa Brooks was not too happy with Mr. Cream, so he did some pretty metal shit about it. He corners Cream in the lobby of a hotel in public, holds a shotgun to his head, and forced him to marry his daughter. It was literally a shotgun wedding, which means I'm free to do my redneck voice, y'all! Woo! <laughs> I'll calm down, sorry. But seriously, Cream wasn't all about that life at all, yo. He agreed to marry Flora after her father's aggressive insistence on the matter, but at the first chance he got, he fucked right off to London because school is more important and there's no angry fathers with shotguns. At least not ones that are looking for him anyway. Here's why I don't think Flora's illness was caused by the likely impromptu abortion. 
The next year, 1877, while Cream is across the pond attending lectures at St. Thomas Hospital, Flora dies of consumption. As with so many others during this era, tuberculosis was fucking crazy rampant. So now, the widow Cream sees another opportunity to scam the insurance company after her death, tries to get $1,000 from them. I have no idea what for. I guess he had a life insurance policy, but that never made sense to me. But only comes away with around $200. He settled for a fifth of what an insurance company would have given him for his very recently dead wife. Thanks, honey. Love you, too. I also didn't know you could file for that stuff from another country. Yeah, I also wondered about that. Did he do that before he left, or was there some long-distance snail mail going back and forth on boats? Well, it matters not, my creamy friend. That $200 must have done him some good regardless, as he had yet another high honor bestowed upon him. In April of 1878, he acquires the much-sought-after... <sighs> Double qualification of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. So is he both now? I think on paper, yes. But I'm not sure if I'd really classify him as either based on what's coming up. So Cream, I think, is getting a little bit anxious. He wants to stay in London, but he also wants a drastic change of scenery. So what, what does he do? He goes to the other London, the one in Ontario. We're getting back on the boat again, all right. While there, he sets up a little medical office on Dundas Street, and it's here that we find the body of our first suspected victim, Kitty Gardner. Well, she's actually found in an outhouse beneath the office, half sitting and half reclining somehow. I can't figure out that image in my head. And there's a bottle of chloroform next to her on the ground. Remember Cream's thesis topic from the very beginning of this episode? Well, the heat is on! That was awful, sorry. They determined at the inquest about her death that it was more likely a murder than a suicide, that somebody had poisoned her with chloroform, and that she had been visiting Cream's office pretty regularly to get an abortion. I don't know if that means multiple abortions, or if there were just a lot of prep leading up to one. Either way, she was there a lot. Which made Cream not want to be near there at all. So much so that he fucks off again, this time to another very familiar location for us, Chicago. Specifically, 434th West Madison Avenue. What up, Chicago? The cool thing about this office was its proximity to the red light district. That means there's going to be a revolving door of sex workers coming and going, hey hey, to perform abortions on, and probably other more deadly stuff involving chloroform. This detail I'm a little bit hazy on, just because of how it was written. It says, quote, he once boasted that he had 15 cases of abortion in a single fancy house. Fancy house is in quotes again. Does that mean he had 15 in a single night, or that he had a total of 15 in a very short amount of time? I can't quite figure... I, I think it was in one night, but either way, there were lots and lots and lots of prostitutes coming and going. Hey, hey. Back on to something we do know, which are the names of his next two victims, and we're going to start with Mary Ann Faulkner. Mary Ann Faulkner worked part-time as the gym leader in Violet City, specializing in flying types, but she got in a bit of trouble one day after a gutsy trainer put her in a tight spot. She goes to Cream for help, whom in turn sends her off to another person with an awesome name, Hattie Mack, and she owed Cream a favor. She's going to help Faulkner get her missing gym badge back. In actuality, Faulkner was in need of an abortion, and I'm guessing was sent to Hattie's apartment to be more discreet because people were getting suspicious of Cream's, quote, clinic. I have to think, if you're performing that many abortions that close to the red light district, your name is gonna get around. I mean, it's not like he had to use his real name, could have had an alias, but still, gonna get around. Well, helping with an abortion is one thing, but I think Miss Hattie Mack was indebted to Mr. Cream for a bit more than back alley midwifery. The second thing is that if you're going to murder someone, you better have a plan to remove the body pretty soon because it starts to smell really badly really, really quickly. Now, I'm sure we've all heard the stories about neighbors reporting a vile stench coming from one of the tenants. This time, it was in reference to Marianne Faulkner. Her decomposing remains were found in one of the back rooms with her Jim's badge lying on the ground next to her. By the way, non-geek listeners, all the Faulkner stuff is a reference to Pokemon. In the Gold and Silver games, Faulkner was the first gym leader you had to battle, and he was basically the bird version of Brock Bird. from the first ones red and blue. The real Faulkner, Marianne, 
didn't have many details attached to her apart from that she needed Thomas's creamy medical expertise. Why did I write that? She was found in the apartment of or house that Hattie Mack had stayed in and that she had died at some point over the course of this interaction, having likely been murdered with either chloroform or strychnine. But remember, I said he had at least two known victims while he was here, so now we gotta talk about the other one. At the same time that all this Faulkner pretrial preparations are going on, the coroner for Boone County, Illinois, receives a, quote, puzzling telegram signed by Dr. Cream. Dr. Cream. He's actually the cousin of a more famous condiment-based physician, Dr. Pepper, okay? Show some respect, Alex. The telegram said, quote, suspect foul play. We'll roll it immediately. This was in reference to a new body found at the morgue that was once a Mr. Dan Stott, and the telegram was signed by, you guessed it, Dr. Cream. From the scant details I have about Dan, he seems like he had an interesting life. He was a, quote, prosperous merchant, whatever that means. I guess he sold stuff to lots of different people. But after two failed marriages, he found himself quite lonely and prone to fits at the ripe old age of 65. So, <sighs> he does what every 65-year-old man with money dreams of doing. He marries a much, much much more age-inappropriate girl for him, a woman named Julia, whom would eventually bear him a child. Ew. At some point, Julia comes across Kareem's clinic to procure some epilepsy medicine for her geriatric hubby. That should be a sign, Julia. So, with Julia being a young woman of close to Kareem's age, and Kareem being a handsome, charismatic, and don't you dare forget dapper young doctor, should be no surprise to you that Julia quickly becomes Kareem's mistress. I think what he actually did was the first ever recorded instance of the Boone County mating call. That's where you shake a pill bottle, yell out, come get it, sweetheart, and then just wait for all the ladies to show up. I am a conduit for nonsense. Also, that's the wild and wonderful whites of West Virginia making its way into the show again. The plan was for Cream to write that letter to the coroner, have him impound the bottle of medicine that Julia purchased, test it on a dog, which died very quickly, aw, and then exhume the body of Dan to confirm the presence of Strychnine, of which there was enough to kill six adults. After that, they were going to sue the drug company that filled the prescription, claiming they'd supplied the poison that killed Dan due to a blunder on their part, so they're just going to lie about it, and then collect on a four to $5,000 payout so they can finally move far away and Julia can officially become Mrs. Cream. The Doctor and Mrs. Cream. <laughs> Sounds like one of those buddy comedies that's based in a hospital. She tries to help him, but is grossly unqualified and just drops shit all the time, and he just watches her try to figure out how to function. That that would be fun. I would watch that show. Or at least a network that produces a show like that. So I think that whole future Mrs. Cream plan is going down at the same time while Mr. Cream is awaiting trial for Faulkner's death. The article's written sort of out of order, but I think somewhere in the middle of the Dan plan is the trial for Faulkner. Either way, these two things happen really close to the same time, like one right after the other, or like kind of overlapping in the middle somewhere, I think. But he is almost sent to jail for the Faulkner one, too. He tried to blame Hattie Mack for the botched abortion, resulting in Faulkner's death, and the loss of a truly great tutorial boss, but Mack fired back with her own attack, she said that not only was it Cream who performed the abortion, but that he had done so over 500 times before all over Canada. That's a shitload of abortions! For one guy. That's too many for one guy, right? Well, as compelling as a testimony as that was, it just wasn't quite enough evidence to go on. While Cream was indicted for murder on September 23rd, 1880 for the Faulkner death, the jury found him not guilty after only 15 minutes of deliberation, citing a lock lack of proper evidence. Man, this really was the perfect era to get away with murder. There weren't nearly as many sophisticated practices regarding evidence collection like we have today. You could get away with the most horrible shit for a long, long time in the 19th century. We still don't know who Jack the Goddamn Ripper is! Jesus! But here's a familiar pattern we still do have today that's also really funny. He got cocky after his acquittal and started writing threatening telegrams to a patient that owed him 20 bucks. A man named Joseph Martin owed him a debt for some sort of doctoral work that Kareem did for his family. In the first letter he wrote, he threatened that he would tell the public that his wife and kids were sick because of something they caught from Joseph. I don't know what that's implying, but in the second letter he wrote, he says, quote, 
I will learn that damn vixen of a low wife of yours to speak ill of me. It could be that he met the man's wife at some point and didn't get along with her, but either way, the letters point toward his general dislike of women as a whole, and you know, they really didn't do much to help him in his future trial much later on in England, or for the current trial for Dan Stott, which is coming up right after this ad break for our new sponsor. Hi, from all of us here at CBC, the Creamy Broadcast Company, we want to thank you for your continued patronage of our network. We take pride in producing great shows like Terror Telegram, The Doctor and the Mysterious Mrs. Cream, and who could forget our latest primetime spotlight, It's Not a Baby, It's Abortion, keeping Chicago and the surrounding areas supplied with the greatest and minimally invasive, reasonably priced entertainment. You have enough to worry about with the expenses of daily life in the red light district. Don't let what's on the radio be one of them. Obviously, that's not a real company, but it sounds like they have a pretty clear understanding of the life of Thomas Neal Cream. Those show names really do nail down what he was all about. We probably only know about this plan, by the way, because Julia made a plea deal and told the police everything they wanted to know, which landed Mr. Cream in Joliet State Prison for the, quote, rest of his natural life and for one day of each year to be spent in solitary confinement beginning in 1881. Take that, sir! That's what you get for deceiving such a lovely young lady into letting you murder her retiree husband. Wow, I thought that was going to be a much longer story. And how is it similar to Jack the Ripper? But wait, there's more! Call now and we'll throw in the second half of the story absolutely free! How are you the one in charge? Don't worry about that, worry about this. Cream's father, the elder Cream, he'd have been well into his buttermilk stage at this point, died in a sanatorium in 1887, and left him $16,000 in 1887 monies in his will, which is nearly $600,000 in 2023 monies, just for reference. How did he get the money, though? Through a series of political decisions, I assume, Cream was pardoned in 1891, not sure why, collected the money from the now-curdled remains of the Elder Cream's estate, and fucked off once again right back over to London, this time the actual one back across the pond in England. We've got a story spanning three different countries and two cities that share the same name that are on two separate continents. You know, at least I guess in a way I still get to travel. In my mind, anyway. And Cream doesn't wait but two weeks before he's back to his diabolically creamy ways. I don't know why I wrote that. A young woman named Ellen Donworth was seen staggering near and leaning against the side of a pub on Waterloo Road in the Red Light District, an all-too-familiar place for us this month. By the way, for those of you keeping track at home, it's impossible for Thomas Neal Cream to have been Jack the Ripper because those murders started in 88 when he was still in prison in Illinois. So, I'm pretty sure that he wasn't Jack the Ripper either. Back to Ellen Donworth, she fell to the ground having convulsions and in between fits somehow stammered out that, quote, A tall gentleman with cross eyes, a silk hat, and bushy whiskers gave me drink twice out of a bottle with stuff in it. I can't do British female very well, any better than I can do a man. Like That was... I'm sorry for that. Was it strict nine? Yes, of course it was. And it wasn't the only thing on Cream's to-do list either. A week later, he spots his next victim, a young woman named Matilda Clover, 27. Unrelated, Matilda's also my female alter ego, but she's been on an extended vacation out of the country and won't be back for a while. I really wish she could have helped me out with that accent a few seconds ago. The real Matilda is found much in the same manner as Ellen was, except for she was seen entering her own lodgings with cream this time. Then around 3 a.m., the entire house is shook by the screams of agony and pain coming from Matilda's room. However, given her fondness for drink, the doctor just assumed she drank herself to death and reported it as caused by a mixture of sedatives and brandy. Kind of like a black and white movie era movie star. I'm ruined! I'll never recover from this enormous setback! Then chugs a pill bottle and washes it down with a single swig of whiskey on the table next to her. Dramatic swoon, faint, and fade to black. Then Cream does something really stupid. This is the part where he gets sloppy and it winds up biting him in the ass later on. He, for some reason, decides murdering hookers with poison isn't enough excitement, and he says, You know what? I need to add a little bit of extortion into my routine. That would be really exciting. So he begins blackmailing the most well-known doctor in town, Dr. William Henry Broadbent. He accuses the doctor of knowingly poisoning Matilda with strychnine, causing her death, and threatening to go public with the information. 
You know, unless, of course, uh, you give me $2,500 and we'll just call it a wash, yeah? Bit of an even trade, yeah? Right? In it? Well, two detectives tried to set an elaborate trap, posting an ad for Malone to come to his clinic. I guess that was the name he used in the letter. Tried to get him to come by to his clinic to negotiate, but Cream probably knew this would happen and then never showed up. Why? He was too busy making plans to fuck off back to Canada again, and by early January, he's back in Quebec City. Don't worry, though. Those letters are coming back later. Don't worry. So he's back in Canada once again, and this time while he's here, he meets a man named McCulloch. I'm not sure of the nature of these two men's relationship, but if I were to hazard a guess, I'd wager it was not a friendly one. We'll see why in a bit, but Cream is just here for a few months to kind of let the heat die down back in the real London. Satisfied that it's cool enough to return, on April 1st, 1892, Cream finds himself getting off yet another boat back into the gloomy, damp haze of 19th century London proper. He'd spend the next ten nights perusing the various shops and markets of the red light district, being ever so careful as to dodge the literal mountains of horse shit helping to pave the streets. Then on April 11th, he meets a couple of ladies. This night, he is posing as Dr. Fred, and he is very interested in Alice Marsh and Emma Shrivel, whom were 21 and 18, respectively. The unlikely trio spent much of the evening together, dining on only the finest nourishment a doctor of such high status could procure. A generous portion of beer and canned salmon would be enough to satisfy even the mightiest of hungers. No, that's awful. Yeah, that doesn't sound good at all. Before departing his two dates, Dr. Fred gives them each three long pills to take, probably posed as some sort of morning-after remedy. It just dawned on me. Um, I don't know if he slept with his victims or not. Nothing I've read says that he did, but, I mean, it seems like it's at least within the scope of possibilities. I'm leaning towards no, though. I feel like there would have been something about that somewhere, but maybe I just haven't found it. But I think no. I'm gonna go with no on that. Either way, around 2.30 in the morning, the lodging house these two girls were staying at was shook with the same type of painful shrieking the residents of Matilda's lodging house had heard a few months ago in the other London. Emma was lying on the floor, shriveled up in pain, and Alice was similarly collapsed in the hallway. Both girls were rushed to the hospital, but Alice passed on the way there, and Emma was pronounced dead by 8 a.m. That sounds like one of the worst possible ways to die, by the way. Yeah, I think strychnine poisoning would be up there with worst ways to be murdered, which incidentally gives me an idea for a new segment. But here's the thing with some serial killers. There's that myth that we've covered on here that they want to get caught, but I think it's more likely they don't want other people to get the credit for what they did, so they edge up closer and closer to the line of getting caught just for the excitement of it. Which, for Dr. Cream, presented itself in the form of paranoia, which prompted him to contact some detectives at Scotland Yard. He was complaining to a friend of his that some policemen were following him around town, which, of course, prompted his friend to think, Should... should we be following him, maybe? Should we be? So that's what they started to do. If some random person calls you and said that the police were following them, you would certainly be curious as to why that was happening, wouldn't you? I would certainly want to know why that person has so much police attention lately. Why are they following you around, Mr. Cream? Obviously, they're following him around to collect enough evidence to bring him in for questioning, which they do in a very short amount of time, partly due to a few previously mentioned blunders on Cream's part. While ranting one day to a detective friend about the murders of Donworth, Clover, and surprise, Player 3 has entered the game, turns out there was a third attempted murder of a prostitute named Lou Harvey. Cream claimed that all three were killed by the same, quote, unconscionable villain, but there were no reports of Lou having been murdered. Turns out, she wasn't, because she was smart. She went on a date with Mr. Cream one evening, and the two shared some wine, took a walk back to the embankment near the train station, and then he gave her some pills to take as a remedy to something, but something didn't quite feel right about the whole situation, so she ended up just throwing the pills over the bridge. This is bizarre. Cream's plan this time was for her to take the pills before attending a concert and to have violent, deadly convulsions while in full view of the audience and all the performers, like a ticking time bomb of just what the fuckery. That, uh, that's a weird one. But we only know this information now because she wrote a letter as a surprise witness at his trial. They had already found plenty of evidence to bring him in for the other murders, but the Lou Harvey letter and the previous letters from Broadbent were the icing on the cake. 
They also conducted an investigation into his history in Canada and the United States, which just made the rest of the London investigation a cakewalk. His whole trial lasted only four days from October 17th to the 21st, and deliberation only took 12 minutes. That's how obviously guilty he was. He was hanged on November 15th at Newgate Prison and is now buried in an unmarked grave. So that's the wild story of another 19th century serial killer that preyed on the sex workers of Chicago and London. This one I'd never heard of before now. I was hoping for a slightly different series of events, but I kept finding myself thinking about Holmes or Jack the Ripper again. That's what I meant earlier when I said that the victims could be switched around. The names are so similar that if you replaced one with another, only the most hardcore researcher would be able to pick out the difference. I'm also sorry for the random mic bumps in today's episode, as I'm sure you're aware. Sometimes I get excited while recording, and my hands flail around because I'm animated, and sometimes they bump the desk, so sorry about those today. I try to edit out all the little stuff like that so you don't have to hear it, but kind of hard to do that today. I got a little too excited. I also try to take out as many breaths and little tongue pops and mouth noises as I can. I don't like hearing those, so I try not to make you guys and gals hear them either. Even the pop filter, not always perfect. But I still did find a lot of new information that I'm glad I learned about today. Namely, I have some new words that I'm going to work into my vocabulary, such as Borak, B-O-R-A-K. It is a noun that means to ridicule, not just a crazy sounding name for one of my probable future characters. To poke Borak at someone, just having a Borak, that's a fun word. Also, the word ludite, it means someone resistant to change or technology, so old people. (laughs) And I'm a little disappointed in myself this week. Also, this is why you should always write everything down if you want to use it. If you have an idea, just write it down. That way you have it and you don't lose it. There was another word that I cannot remember that I could have used to make a joke about being a podcast host, but I failed myself and didn't write it down, so now I can't remember. Shame on me! But I think that's going to be all from us today. Hopefully you learned something new. Maybe you'd never heard of Thomas Neal Cream before either. I'm just excited for a different name. Or maybe you can make use of some new vocabulary in rotation. That was the creamiest murder we've ever talked about on this show, wasn't it? Either way, I hope you liked that story. If you did, please do me and all your other favorite pods a favor. Give us a five-star rating in whichever thing you listen on that lets you do that. iTunes is a good option to figure that out on. You can also contact me with anything you want at Second Self Podcast on Instagram or at the show email, my second self and I at gmail.com, as mentioned by Alex earlier in the episode. Also, I had an idea for another interesting thing I can do separate from this show. I am going to upload it through this channel, though, so it will appear in the normal show feed on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen. But it'll be labeled a little bit differently just so you can see the difference. So I'm going to go do that. So keep an ear or two out. But in the meantime, have a great rest of your week, everybody. Make smart choices and stay kind. Bye.